Welcome to this session entitled New Insights into Zika Virus Biology, which I have the privilege to chair. Let me share my screen now. So in this session, we are going to highlight some of the basic research discoveries um, that were made in the Zika Plan Consortium. And I'll start with a talk entitled What Mosquito Genetics Taught Us About Zika Virus Emergence. And one could wonder uh, what mosquito genetics have to do with Zika virus emergence. And in this talk, I'm going to try to illustrate that the two are actually uh, connected. Zika virus was first isolated in 1947 from a sentinel monkey in the Zika forest of Uganda. And for the next 60 years, it was considered an innocuous virus because there were only a few, actually less than 20 reported human cases, and all of them were associated with mild and self-limiting symptoms. In 2007, Zika virus was responsible for a relatively large outbreak on the island of Yap in Micronesia. In the following years, it caused other outbreaks in uh, islands of the Pacific Ocean, namely um, New Caledonia and French Polynesia, for example. In 2014, Zika virus reached Brazil, where it was introduced and then spread out until it uh, was responsible for a massive outbreak throughout uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. It culminated in 2016, when the, the World Health Organization raised the status of Zika virus to that of public health emergency of international concern primarily because of these uh, novel clinical manifestations such as the neurological complications and the birth defects. So in the last few years, considerable research effort has been made to try and understand the factors that may have triggered and facilitated the spectacular emergence of Zika virus in the Pacific and in Latin America. Perhaps less attention has been paid to the reverse situation. There are regions of the world where Zika virus did not emerge. And one of those regions is Africa, where we know the virus is present since it was isolated there for the first time. And it has been circulating in the human population as was seen in, in Angola in 2016 and previously in Gabon in 2007. So it, it is kind of puzzling why there was a lack of large-scale human outbreaks in Africa, despite seemingly favorable conditions. There is one single exception, which is Cape Verde, where massive outbreaks occurred in 2015 and 2016. What we hypothesized was that perhaps this exception to Zika virus emergence in Africa may have something to do with this mosquito, Aedes aegypti. The reason why it could have something to do with this mosquito is that Aedes aegypti consists of two subspecies. Aedes aegypti formosus, the African subspecies, which is a dark form primarily found in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and Aedes aegypti aegypti, the globally invasive subspecies, which is found in the tropics and subtropics of the rest of the world in Asia and in the Americas. Aedes aegypti formosus is a generalist that breeds in a variety of urban and forest habitats, whereas Aedes aegypti aegypti is a human specialist that preferentially bites humans and breeds in the domestic environment. Aedes uh, aegypti aegypti, the human specialist, is thought to have evolved from generalist ancestors around 5,000 to 10,000 years ago, somewhere in Western Africa and its domestication allowed its global expansion during the slave trading period. To experimentally test whether the two subspecies of Aedes aegypti may have different abilities to transmit Zika virus, we sampled populations that were representative of the two subspecies around the world. Three populations from the Americas, three populations from Africa, and two populations from uh, Southeast Asia. And then we exposed these mosquitoes to a panel of six Zika virus strains representative of the currently circulating viral genetic diversity. And the results of our survey are represented here on this slide. You can see 
uh, pie charts, which each represent um, the mosquito population. Each slice of the pie chart is one of the six viruses of our panel. When the color is blue, it means that the mosquito is susceptible. When the color is red, it means that the mosquito is resistant. So what you can clearly see already is that the three mosquito populations from Africa are more red than the populations from out of Africa, which are more in the blues, which means that mosquitoes from Africa are more resistant on average to Zika virus infection than mosquitoes from uh, the rest of the world. And so it looks like Aedes aegypti formosus, the African subspecies, is more resistant to Zika virus infection, regardless of the virus um, strain, than the Aedes aegypti aegypti globally invasive subspecies. To further investigate the genetic basis of this difference, we used two complementary approaches. In the first, we took advantage of natural hybrids between the two subspecies that occur in some places of Africa and we measured the relationship between Zika virus susceptibility, which is represented here uh, as the oral infectious dose 50%, which is the dose of virus in the blood meal that is required to infect 50% of the mosquito uh, population as a function of the proportion of the Aedes aegypti aegypti genome relative to the Aedes uh, aegypti formosus genome in those hybrid populations. And you see that there is a negative relationship meaning that susceptibility increases as the proportion of Aedes aegypti aegypti genome increases. The other approach that we use is to perform an artificial cross between mosquitoes from Guadeloupe, representing the Aedes aegypti aegypti subspecies, and mosquitoes from Gabon, representing the Aedes aegypti formosus subspecies. This cross allowed us to perform genetic mapping and locate genetic factors on the second chromosome of the mosquito, which are, which are responsible for the difference in Zika virus susceptibility between the two uh, mosquito subspecies. In conclusion, our findings indicate that the domestication of Aedes aegypti and its subsequent global spread out of Africa was associated with an increase in its susceptibility to Zika virus infection. And we think that this may have facilitated Zika virus emergence, not only through increased vector host contact, but also due to uh, the enhanced vector susceptibility. This, uh, we believe, may offer an explanation for the lack of large-scale Zika virus outbreaks in Africa, where the mosquito subspecies that is uh, uh, dominant is uh, more resistant to Zika virus infection and uh, subsequent transmission. With that, I would like to thank all of the people who contributed to this study, particularly Fabien Aubry, a talented postdoc who led the work that I presented today. And thank you for your attention. Now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to the next speaker. So again, we'll do um, a session of questions and answers at the end of the session um, after uh, the three speakers of the session. So the next speaker is uh, Daniela Weiskopf, who is an assistant professor at La Jolla Institute for Immunology in California. Daniela is one of the world experts in T cell immunity against viruses. And today she's going to talk about pre existing T cell memory against Zika virus, of course. Thank you, then, Daniela. Over to you. Thank you so much, Louis. And thank you for your interesting talk. And I think this session is so great because this session looks at the, um, the difference in uh, um, virology, immunology, and uh, also other um, um, mouse uh, from all sides of it. The question that um, I was most interested in, if there is, um, a pre-existing T cell memory against Zika in people that have never eaten it. Basically, in other words, I was wondering, can exposure to one virus influence the subsequent infection with a different virus? And 
That question is all based on the hallmark of the immune system. So T cells are part of the adaptive immune system and the hallmark of the immune system, the adaptive immune system is that it actually can remember. So once you have an infection, a primary infection, you will, um, after clearance of the virus, form memory T cells. And these memory T cells linger around and stay with you for like, you know, years or many, um, also for a lifetime. So the question is what happens when you see um, the same virus again, or if you see a virus that is closely related to it so that you can assume there is some um, cross-reactive um, reaction. So there's different scenarios. So you can imagine if you see the same virus, again and that's what is basically um the premise of like you know subsequent um infection with the homotypic uh, virus um you have protection and you have the viral clearers what happens if the secondary virus is a heterologous virus so it's another dengue serotype or in this case a zika infection so you can imagine you can either have cross-reactive protection and viral clearers or you have insufficient cross projection and contribution to pathogenesis. So that's all of the different scenarios that um, can happen if you have subsequent infection with a closely related virus. And why are we interested in that in the case of Zika, which is um, a very um, 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 graph here to show you, um, there is a wide geographical overlap in these flaviovirus distributions. So all of the areas where Zika has been circulating is areas where dengue virus circulated before. And also other viruses do have, other flaviviruses have overlapping um, areas of this. So the question is, these are all closely related viruses. Do infections any of these viruses have an effect of subsequent infection? And that's the question we wanted to ask. And particularly in this case, we wanted to ask um, areas that have been exposed to dengue virus before, which is, as I said, many, many of these endemic various areas where then Zika was circulating, um, have any influence of Zika virus. So in order to answer these questions, you need to uh, know which exact part of the virus are recognized by T cells. And in, in contrast to like um, B cells and antibodies, um, T cells do not recognize the entire virus. They recognize small parts of it um, that are presented on the surface of infected cells. So in order to know which are the ones that are recognized, we actually had to like, you know, map these responses. And this is just to show you a quick assay strategy. So we always are interested in the entirety of the virus. So this um, shows you that we mapped um, pools containing many, many peptides, 20 peptides each, um, spanning the entire virus. And once we realized which one is positive, we then deconvoluted it to find the exact sequence of the virus that is recognized. And in this case, this was all tested in um, donors that have been exposed to dengue virus, but have been collected way before um, Zika virus was circulating. So we, have, we are, were very sure that these have not been exposed to Zika virus, but have been exposed to dengue virus. And this is just an example of how we measure this. So in case you see a positive response, your early spot as it lights up, like T cells um, make uh, interferon gamma responses against these peptides. So this helps us to identify exactly which one of these um, areas of the virus are recognized. So if you now look at the results overall, this is the summary of the epitopes per donor and also the magnitude of the positive responses that we have identified. It's quite remarkable to see that uh, out of all the donors we tested, on average, every donor recognizes five different areas of the Zika virus, um, even though these people have never seen a Zika virus. There's certain donors that recognize close to 40, but that's certainly the exception. So overall, um, every donor sees about five regions of the Zika virus without having seen the virus itself. And if you see in magnitude, you can also see a quite a different spread of it. There are certain areas that are recognized with high, high magnitude. That means um, the T cells recognize it with a response of a lot of interferon gamma. And there's definitely certain areas um, that are recognized lower, but still all um, account for a positive response against it. So if you look into more detail on where these areas are that are recognized from the Zika virus, this is just a summary to show you um, where all of the different proteins account for um, the recognition. And you can quickly see that we found um, 
cross-reactive epitopes in all of the proteins uh, that we were looking at with the exception of NS2B, which is some uh, protein we did not find any of the epitopes. But other than that, um, we found um, epitopes in all of the, of the Zika virus proteome. In, the, in case though with different responses as I just mentioned before, like some are recognized very strongly, some are recognized rather lowly, for example, this one and it's 2A. So this is a different way to look at this. This is the epitopes for protein and this is the magnet of response. And you can fairly quickly see that the strongest responses and also the majority of responses is against um, proteins that are conserved between flaviviruses. We know NS3 and NS5 are highly conserved between um, not only the different serotypes of dengue, but also between dengue and Zika virus. So not surprisingly, this is where we found the majority of uh, their responses, cross-reactive responses. So if you then look into this uh, different area, um, different way of plotting the results. So if you plot the magnitude of the response based as a function of the similarity between the viruses, so this is the sequence identity between the Zika virus and the dengue virus, you see that the strongest ones are actually um, recognized in the highest conserved areas. So this is, we were interested then into actually into more detail to what is the exactly magnitude of the responses that are recognized. So we made T cell lines um, with all of these um, epitopes. And keep in mind, these are Zika derived epitopes recognized in dengue um, exposed donors. So um, if you then look into more detail, um, you can see that if you make T cell lines against the original Zika um, epitope that we have identified, which is in case of here uh, plotted in the black line, you see that um, also other serotypes of dengue, the sort of homologous sequence in other um, dengue viruses, dengue serotypes, are recognized in this case. We also found cases where like not only um, other peptides from dengue virus are recognized, but also yellow fever, chapel encephalitis, West Nile virus, and tick-borne encephalitis. So this is uh, uh, definitely an area um, stemming from the NS3 protein, where not only the Zika protein, the Zika pep that is recognized, but all cross flaviviruses that are recognized. And here you can see there's cases where like, you know, again, the zero dengue zero complex is mostly recognized and the Zika peptide. So we do see um, not only um, cross reactivity um, here confirmed at a single epitope level between dengue and Zika virus, but some cases also across the dengue serotype. So that is something that I think um, is interesting to keep in mind. You cannot look at one infection of a virus as a single entity. All of the people, many of the people living in these endemic areas have been exposed to um, many of uh, these flaviviruses. So there is effect of previous infection to subsequent infection. That is something that um, I think we should keep in mind, not only for um, this case in the flaviviruses, but we have also recently shown that for SARS-CoV-2, where also previous exposure to human coronaviruses um, um, can have an influence in subsequent infection. So just to summarize and conclude this part here, we do detect responses in, against Zika virus in people that have never seen it. On average, um, five different areas of the virus are recognized. Um, the positive response is correlated with the protein size and also the sequence conservation. And the more conserved these proteins are between the different viruses, the higher the responses was. And we showed you direct evidence of cross-reactive T-cell responses when you do the T-cell lines. And you can see that they not only recognize dengue, but also um, far across um, other uh, flaviviruses. And with that, I hope um, I convinced you that, uh, uh, that you cannot look at the entity as a single infection, but you always need to keep in mind that there people have during their lifetime exposed multiple viruses. And I'd just like to thank um, the Great Zika Plan Consortium that has been uh, funding a lot of this research and uh, shown here our great partners uh, within the network that have been helping collecting the donors um, in these areas. So um, thank you very much. And I give it back to uh, Louis. Many thanks, Daniela. It was a very clear presentation. We're now switching to the next speaker, who is Suzanne Katain. Suzanne is a group leader at the Rega Institute for Medical Research 
at the Catholic University in Leuven, Belgium. And uh, she's uh, actively involved in several research programs to develop experimental models to study viruses and develop antivirals. And today she's going to talk about mouse models and the development of antivirals against Zika virus. Suzanne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Louis. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, so indeed, like Louis uh, said, I will be presenting data obtained in uh, Zika studies using different mouse models. Um, so already two years before the Zika virus outbreak in Brazil, we established a, a model for Zika virus infections in mice to be able to uh, assess the in vivo efficacy of Zika virus inhibitors. And uh, for this, we use uh, immunocompromised agent 129 mice, um, and these lack uh, the receptors for interferon alpha, beta, and gamma, which makes them highly susceptible to Zika virus infections, as you can also see in this, in this graph. So if you infect them with a low inoculum, you will see that this already results in uh, 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 development of disease and also mice had to be euthanized. Um, if you give uh, more virus to these, these animals, of course, you get a faster progression of the disease and mice also had to be euthanized earlier. At the time that we euthanized the mice, we could also detect uh, Zika in different tissues, like in the spinal cord, the brain, but also liver, kidney, and, and, and spleen. Uh, so this is a very good model to test uh, antivirals. However, uh, although we did uh, screen uh, over 600,000 compounds, uh, we did not identify a, a good compound with also good pharmacokinetic uh, uh, properties, which uh, justifies, of course, efficacy studies in animals. But we also have a group of people working in the, the group of young knights that are working on a vaccine, and they developed a, a vaccine against Zika, which is actually a chimeric vaccine, as you can uh, see here. So it's actually based on the yellow fever vaccine. Um, and when you vaccinate these AG129 mice, um, yeah, they are fully protected against a lethal uh, challenge with Zika, as you can uh, see here, this blue line. Uh, and also um, viral RNA levels were below the level of uh, quantification as uh, presented here by the, the blue squares. Um, we also um, assess the efficacy of this vaccine in the intraplacental Zika virus challenge mouse model. Uh, and this was established at the University of uh, Liège. And in this model, uh, pregnant mice, which are immunocompetent mice, are infected at the, the fetal site of the placenta, uh, which results in uh, brain abnormalities in uh, fetuses. Now, when you then uh, immunize these, these pregnant uh, mice prior to infection, uh, you will see that the, the viral RNA levels in, in, in the brain of fetuses at uh, embryonic day 80.5, which, which is just before birth, are again around uh, the level of quantification. Um, and we also um, looked at immunostaining of fetal brains at the same time point. And then you see there is no uh, brain abnormality, abnormality, abnormalities detected in these fetuses, uh, whereas uh, fetuses that were born to uh, non-vaccinated mothers are positive for Zika, uh, as indicated by these red dots, and they are also positive for apoptosis, as uh, indicated by the green dots. So it shows that the vaccine is highly efficacious in protecting in, in mice. Um, now, in addition uh, to testing antivirals uh, and a vaccine, uh, we also use this AG129, a mouse model, uh, to assess the pathogenic potential of Zika virus strains from both the African and Asian uh, lineage. Uh, and uh, this is a collaboration with uh, the lab of Louis. Uh, Louis Lambrecht here heading the session, uh, and also the group of Laurent and Miguel in, in, uh, in Liège. Uh, and we assembled a set of seven uh, recently isolated Zika virus strains um, based actually on the broad phylogenetic uh, coverage, the worldwide geographical distribution, uh, and also the minimal passage history. Um, we decided to select three non-epidemic, uh, two epidemic strains from the Asian lineage, 
and also to low passage isolates from the African uh, lineage, as sh shown here. Um, now, when we infected mice, uh, uh, the H1 to 9 mice, we saw that all uh, mice infected with the African strains, they became morbid and had to be euthanized on day six post infection. Um, the Thailand strain, on the other hand, uh, showed a uh, considerably uh, more attenuated uh, uh, profile, and we even had 50% uh, survival. And then all the other uh, Asian Zika virus strain, they showed a more intermediate uh, pathogenic profile, uh, as observed here. Um, we also uh, looked at uh, viral load in blood and, uh, and, and tissues. Um, and for this, we used a smaller selection of the, of the Zika virus strains. So we tested the two uh, strains from Africa uh, and also the, the attenuated Thailand strain. And we selected French Polynesian strain as a representative of uh, all the other uh, Asian Zika virus strains. Um, well, viral load in, in plasma uh, and in uh, tissues uh, were considerably uh, higher, as you can see, uh, for mice that were infected uh, with the uh, African uh, strain, as observed here by these red and orange lines and also the red and orange uh, dots. Uh, so this uh, clearly indicates that the African strains are more pathogenic and result in a significantly higher mobility and mortality in these AG129 mice. Um, we also uh, evaluated uh, Zika virus induced microcephaly um, caused by intraplacental injection of the Zika virus in, in the mouse embryos. For this, we selected three Zika virus strains. So we have the Senegal strain from 2015, the Thailand strain, and the French Polynesian strain. Um, and um, at embryonic day uh, 14.5, which is four days after uh, infection, um, embryos infected with the Senegal strain had higher viral loads in different tissues, as you can see here by the red dots. Um, and in addition, all uh, embryos uh, infected with the Senegal uh, uh, strain um, oops, wrong button, my apologies, had uh, edema, subcutaneous edema, as you can see in this, uh, in this picture. Um, we also looked at a later time point at embryonic day 80.5, which is just before birth. Um, and interestingly, by this day, um, the Senegal strain caused massive embryonic death, so we cannot e even examine their brains. Um, interestingly, when we compare the two Asian strains, the, the Thailand and the French Polynesian strain, uh, we noticed or uh, observed that the Thailand strain resulted in a more pronounced microcephaly and also, you can see that here very clear, uh, larger ventricles uh, than the French Polynesian strain. Um, so together, these results show that uh, the Zika virus strains with higher levels um, of infection at, at, at early uh, during pregnancy are also associated with more severe serotypes uh, uh, later during uh, uh, pregnancy. And also the results from this enteroplacental uh, Zika virus challenge uh, model also raises the hypothesis that uh, Zika virus may have evolved towards uh, uh, attenuation by causing birth defects rather than, uh, than, uh, than fetal uh, loss. Okay, uh, this, with this, I want to uh, uh, close the presentation. I just want to thank all the people that contributed to this, uh, uh, to this research. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne, for this very interesting presentation. We now have about 15 minutes for a Q&A session. So again, let me remind everybody, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. I'm gonna open the window and uh, read the first two questions that were already deposited. Well, I guess the first one is for me. 
So the first question is from Adam Nera, who's uh, challenging my hypothesis about Zika virus. And so the statement is uh, that a mutation in old Zika happened in Northeast Brazil sometime between um, August 2014 and December 2014. Well, I'm afraid there is a bit of a misunderstanding here um, because our hypothesis, at least the hypothesis that I presented today, relates to the mosquito genetic diversity, not the virus. It is uh, definitely possible that uh, Zika virus evolution may have somehow played a role in uh, its emergence. And there are a handful of mutations um, that have been identified that could have indeed uh, enhanced transmissibility and or virulence of Zika virus after its emergence. But this is not mutually exclusive with uh, the hypothesis I, um, I um, described earlier, which has to do with genetic differences in the mosquito, not the virus. So what we hypothesized was that differences between the African subspecies and the globally invasive subspecies Aedes aegypti could explain the uh, pattern of uh, Zika virus emergence on a, on a continental basis, namely in Africa, where we didn't see any large scale um, Zika virus emergence events, as opposed to in uh, South America, the Caribbean and the Pacific, uh, where there, were, there was massive uh, emergence of Zika virus. So our hypothesis um, is that mosquitoes from Africa were less able to transmit Zika virus, which we demonstrate with a panel of different virus strains. Uh, and, and the result that African mosquitoes are less capable of transmitting Zika virus was uh, correct for all of the virus uh, strains that we tested. And those including not only um, pre-epidemic Zika virus strains from the Asian lineage, epidemic virus strains from the, ep from the Asian lineage, but also uh, representative of the African um, lineage. So again, um, whether Zika virus evolved is not mutually exclusive uh, with the fact that mosquitoes have different abilities to transmit depending on, on their genetic background. So uh, I hope this is clearer now. The next question I would like to answer is uh, from uh, Selena Maria Turci Mortelli, and this is a question to Daniela. Daniela, the question is whether the lab results you presented have been described by field studies. So I guess the question is whether uh, there are any field-based um, studies who, uh, that support the evidence you presented from your lab experiments. Yeah, that's a very good question, and uh, and that's something that um, needs to be addressed in the bigger context of epidemiologists. So, for what we have been showing is that your immune system, your T cells, do recognize um, um, parts of the virus, even though they have never seen the virus. Now, the question is, what does it all? And these have been like collected from the field human studies that have been naturally infected with like dengue virus. So, so now we need to find out what does it all mean? Like, does it having these cross react response? Does it help you, hurt you, or it doesn't matter at all? And in the case of like um, Zika infection after dengue infection, there has been uh, some studies. One I can think of is um, epidemiological study coming out of Nicaragua, where they have been showing that if you have had a, sick, a dengue infection in the last um, six to eight years before you have seen Zika, you're actually better off um, than when you have like had dengue infection like from farther out. What we don't know yet, and what is a question I think that's on everybody's mind. So now a lot of these people have seen what happens if they now see dengue again? And that's another question that is um, that is coming up right now because there is a lot of dengue infection now in these same areas. So I think that is something that will need to be addressed um, with large epidemiological studies where they collect all this information on you know um, these samples. So, but it's uh, definitely a, a very um, uh, relevant question. Thanks. Let me follow up on that aspect of. Um interference between uh, pre-existing dengue virus uh, immunity and Zika virus infection. Uh, I think, at least that's what I understand, um, that there is some um, uh, contrasted results or sometimes even contradictory results um, 
about whether pre-existing immunity against uh, dengue virus or Zika virus actually uh, would protect against dengue disease. Uh, it seems that it depends on the serotype or the strain. Um, so I'd like to know your take on this, Daniela. Yeah, definitely. And uh, and um, the 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 fact is that there's a lot of things we don't know. So what I've been looking at is like the teaser response. It's the very same can be true for like you know antibody response that also can have cross which is something that I have not looked into it. Um, we certainly have shown that uh, um, it very much depends if you had primary infection. So if you only seen one of the serotypes, you have a different uh, response than when you have seen already like multiple, like seeing you had multiple dengue infections before Zika, um, that induces a more cross-reactive response. So I think there's a lot of different um, um, parameters that need to be looked at and, uh, and and also what I'm thinking is very interesting that uh, it's not like one epitope, it's like already every person recognizes multiple. So, so I think you really need to look into this in a more global perspective and then um, see um, the difference in epidemiological field sites. So I think just in the lab, it's gonna be difficult to, um, to make the connection with what is protective. We can just show like what is recognized and then uh, field studies need to be shown like you know if that has a protective effect or not of course difficult to do you know and uh this is a great network so i hope uh, we can continue continue um in you know having access to samples where we have associated uh, um outcome so we know people have been um infected again and are have been protected thank you i hope so too we have another question from Abdul Hali Mohammed Lawal, who is um, making a comment, I think more than a question. Um, African Zika virus strain is more pathogenic, but the vector is less transmissible. So if this is true, the vaccine, which is found to be efficacious, efficacious is to be improved before the pandemic. And it's true that on the one hand, we have mosquitoes in Africa that are less uh, competent for, for Zika virus transmission, uh, but the Zika virus strains in Africa, those from the African lineage, uh, which relates to the data um, Suzanne presented, uh, seems to be more transmissible. Uh, so it looks like so far, um, the lower competence of the mosquitoes won over the higher transmissibility of the viruses there. Uh, but it is definitely um, something we need to keep in mind that those viruses in Africa um, have potentially uh, um, more severity and uh, higher transmissibility uh, in the case they escaped uh, from Africa. Um, so I think this is where uh, the comment is headed. Um, and perhaps we could... Um, we could elaborate on that a little bit, uh, if, if you will, uh, Daniela and, uh, and Suzanne. Um, what about your thoughts on uh, whether uh, genetic diversity of the viruses, and specifically uh, the existence of the African lineage, uh, which has never been involved in any human outbreak so far, uh, any reported human outbreak, uh, whether this could uh, represent a serious threat to any uh, vaccine and or antiviral in the future? Um, well, um, it's difficult to say, of course. Um, I have to be honest that uh, for our vaccine candidates, uh, we only so far tested it against the Asian uh, uh, Zika virus strain. Um, so this is the MR766, which is, of course, more kind of a laboratory strain, but we also tested against a, a strain from uh, Suriname, which is again an Asian lineage strain. Um, so no, we, I do not know whether it is efficacious uh, against uh, the, the African lineage uh, strain. Um, so I, I, it's possible that it's not efficacious, um, but yeah, I also don't see why it's not efficacious, but maybe yeah, Daniela can better comment on that. Um, yeah, I can definitely my view on uh, from the T cell side. So yeah. uh, one thing that is good about the T cells is that they recognize multiple targets. So there's never reliance on just one. 
So that's good news. So even if you have like a, a, a mutation in between the lineages in one of the epitopes, you also recognize other ones. I showed you like um, on average, people recognize five different five different epitopes. Um, and, and I also showed you that uh, they not only recognize without the serotype above the serotype complex, but also like even completely other flaviviruses. So they are, so T cells are very tolerant in terms of like mutations. So I would be surprised if that would, that the different lineage would like, you know, take into account. I cannot speak, of course, it could be if you change conformational epitopes, you'd have a different antibodies, but on a T cell side, I, I do think that, um, the, the response is broad enough that that would not make any effect. Thanks for this um, hopeful response. Um, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A function. Well, yes, there's one that just popped up. Uh, again, from Selena, um, is there a Zika vaccine in the horizon? And what would be the limitations of it? I guess that's a question for the two of you, or maybe Daniela first. I definitely know there are certain companies that are um, in a development phase of a Zika vaccine. I think it has been somewhat halted because you always need to have efficacy trials. So if and and we all know that the transmission of Zika virus went down. So we, so many of these companies did not have enough um, infections to actually prove efficacy of their vaccine. And uh, I don't know if we should hope for like picking Zika infections back up, or, or we should just be good for now. But uh, I do know that there is uh, <laughs> definitely um, vaccines in the work, and uh, and they will be having efficacy trials if the virus picks up again. Suzanne, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, there it is. The only because um, the question is also about limitations. Uh, so one limitation could also be, of course, um, it, it should also be uh, safe to use in, in pregnant uh, women, of course, and that's always um, yeah to, difficult to uh, to test this in the field. Um, but yeah, that I do not have anything else to to comment. Another question from Michael Paul who's wondering whether the African Zika virus strain explains the difficulty of isolating Zika virus among African countries in many studies. Well, I don't think there is um, any issue from the virological point of view, because these uh, strains from the, Zika, from, the, from the African lineage um, grow very well in cell culture and they can be isolated from clinical isolates, provided uh, the clinical isolate contains the virus. The reason why we hardly isolate them in the field is because they don't circulate among humans. Um, all of the isolates or most of the isolates that we have from the African lineage come from uh, sylvatic mosquitoes where the virus circulates um, in its sylvatic cycle. And so the reason why we don't see uh, them very often in studies is because we have uh, only a handful of uh, African uh, virus strains that are available. Most of them are old and heavily passaged, uh, with the exception of a few recent strains from Senegal, uh, which um, Suzanne showed earlier. Uh, but I think there is no uh, technical limitation in isolating these viruses, besides the fact that they're uh, rarely found in humans. With that, I think we're reaching the end of our session. So I'd like to thank the speakers again uh, for uh, the presentations. And then I'm going to hand it over to Annelise. Well, thank you for the chairs of the two first sections. Um, um, Elizabeth and you, Louis, you really kept to time. We had very good discussions. I think um, the topics are absolutely interesting. So um, we all need a biological break. Um, so we'll now have a break for just 15 minutes. And while you have a break and you have some time and you are yeah, you love tweeting. Um, remember that we have a Twitter account, hash Zika Plan Unite. So do tweet and tell, tell the world what you've learned and, um, and all, about all these interesting talks. So meet you again in exactly five minutes, which in the UK is 3.15, in Switzerland is 4.15, and in Brazil, I would not know. So, so see you soon. <laughs>